Hi everyone, thank you for coming. So Roy did a great presentation on the depot stuff, so I'll go on and explain how the plasma works and why do we actually need it. So um, basically, okay, I'll make some short introduction that we need scaling because um, we have Bitcoin at uh, seven transactions per second due to just the proof of work. Currently Ethereum at its block capacity, it can handle up to 28 transactions per second, but that's only if you're doing like simple financial transactions, not also uh, smart contract calls. And uh, we want to do better than that. Also, I want to thank Patrick from King's College for this slide because yeah, I took it from him. And uh, why do we actually need all that? Is why don't we just go with a centralized solution? Is because we have this dilemma, sort of, that we sort of always want to have a lot of users, a lot of transactions, but we also want to maintain the system to be actually like censorship resistant and um, secure. So how do we do that? So there are various approaches. So firstly, we can go with a centralized one, but we said we don't want that. We can use an alternative approach like a DAG, which is not the topic of tonight. You can also use sharding. However, I have been arguing these days that the sharding approaches that are being used currently are actually more of the layer two approach. But again, this is another discussion. And then we can go to the off-chain, which is what we love and talk all the time. So off-chain is like instead of having the whole validator set of the layer one, like validating the whole state, in, in off-chain we have sort of local consensus. So we have like everyone that is in the side chain, they talk about or wherever that you are off-chain. You're only speaking with these participants and then you have like local consensus and you all get, you all agree on whatever. And uh, there are two approaches. So we can always go with side chains or with state channels. State channels or, state channel or payment channels. And we're gonna talk about side chains or, well, Plasma, which is a non-custodial sidechain. So, um, yeah. So, what is Plasma? What is a sidechain? You can use this slide either for a sidechain or Plasma. Basically, the idea, the very, very, like, one-minute idea is that on Plasma or on a sidechain, you have some money on one chain and some on another. And basically, you just lock your money on the one chain. The other chain listens for some transaction that verifies that this money was actually locked and then you get that money on the side chain. Then you do whatever you want on the other chain, and when you want to get it back, what you're doing is you simply, like in Plasma lingo, we just say that you exit it. In the side chain lingo, you say that you burn it and the token gets printed again. So I hope this is clear because this is like where we base our whole assumptions. However, the main difference in Plasma is that contrary, so in side chains, you don't need any, any, anything else. You just have a special transaction that happens here and it's done. However, in uh, Plasma, what we're doing in order to maintain safety is that we have a block commitment. So every block that happens on Plasma, we also need to commit it on the main chain. And we take the Merkle tree that gets constructed from all its uh, transactions, and uh, we take the Merkle root and we submit the block. Yes? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. So going again at this. So we take every block and we make a Merkle root from the block and we commit it. And this is done to maintain safety. Because currently, the problem with uh, sidechains is that if you need to make that transaction, and if the sidechain consensus does not want you to do this, to do this transaction because it's Byzantine, like we said before, um, you cannot make this transaction. So if the sidechain consensus goes bad, your funds are basically stuck, and we don't want that. So Plasma solves this by when we make this block commitments, if the consensus goes bad here, you can do essentially an exit from the earliest valid state, from the latest valid state. And uh, currently we have a Plasma implementation which uh, you can play with and uh, you can install a command line interface that you can initialize and start interacting with it. So it's real, it works. And uh, here are some commands that you can do, it doesn't matter right now. And um, what we did is that at some point, like there was the original Plasma paper by Vitalik and Joseph Poon. It was a good paper, sort of. It, it was a 50-page document that it laid out the vision, but we didn't have something uh, concrete, something that we can use to implement what uh, Plasma is. So Vitalik did a post on, uh, about Plasma Cache, a different Plasma construction on March. And a few months ago, I wrote something to try to get all the knowledge on Plasma Cache in one place. And this is sort of how the, this presentation became, and you can read this and get a pretty good understanding of Plasma Cache is. So getting on, why do we want this Plasma? Why do we specifically want the Plasma Cache variant? So firstly, it's real, which is like a fairly good thing. So then we have like the security of the Plasma Cache 
It's each coin that you have on the plasma chain, it is unique. And I will get on to that, why it allows you to have a very easy um, consensus safety. Then you also have low data requirements. So the other plasma alternatives, they require you that you have a lot of data stored on your client. So you cannot really actually have a full, no, uh, you cannot actually run a plasma client, a plasma wallet on your phone very easily without having some sort of trust compromise. And also the great thing on uh, this plasma variant is that any kind of, let's say, problem or thing that you do not like, you can add a plugin, you can, it's totally modular. If you have something that you do not like, you make some small alterations to the protocol and it actually, it's very easy to make it. So yeah, firstly, there are some uh, problems with uh, payments, so you can fix this by changing some of the transaction formats. And then you can use basically some sort of zero knowledge proof for making your light clients even more efficient. And I'll get to this in a bit more details in a few seconds. So firstly, uh, I think that you have heard of maybe Plasma, Plasma Classic, Plasma MVP, Plasma More VP, Plasma Cash, Plasma Prime, Plasma whatever. And it's a kind of pain and it has caused a lot of confusion, like which is the real Plasma. They say Plasma Cash is Plasma, but we don't know that. So um, currently, I will try to do a very fast taxonomy on what is what. So. The one variant, the one that we're building on, is the one which has root chain enforced non-fungibility of deposits. So when you deposit some money from the main net, from the main chain, so from Ethereum, to the plasma chain, you get a non-fungible coin. So it's a coin that has some value. And, uh, and that, it has like this very easy exit game, which I'm getting on in a second. And it has like two main disadvantages that in order, after a while, maybe you need to have like bigger the proofs that you need in order to make a transfer of your coins uh, they become bigger as time passes, so we can use some sort of proof in order to make this smaller. This is what I was referring to by the modular architecture. And in order to like solve the payments problem, in order to make more granular payments, you can you can also da do some uh, other modification in the protocol. Then there is the there is the variants of plasma which require exit ordering. So when you're exiting your your funds, it's essentially your intent to take your money from the plasma chain back to the main chain. And the current approaches that are being used are Plasma MVP and a variant called More Viable Plasma, which solves some of Plasma MVP's uh, problems. And uh, yeah, the most viable plasma, it's mostly a joke about the names. And uh, finally, there is a version of uh, Plasma which uses zero knowledge uh, snarks, which uh, is a callback or. Is it on? Is it on? Yeah, it is. Okay. And uh, which uses the zero knowledge proofs, and you can use it essentially to verify that every state transition is valid. And uh, we're not so sure about this, it's pretty complex, so let's get on. So, firstly, I want to do some uh, preliminary knowledge for this. So, usually, I guess, like most are familiar with Merkle trees if you're technical. If you're not, I'm getting into it right now. So, uh, Merkle tree is used to prove succinctly, you, we want to prove membership or non membership of some element in a set. So if we have like four elements in the leaves here and we want to prove the inclusion of A in the tree, in the, um, in the set, we, we need like fewer elements than if we had just gave you the whole set and you just checked if it is there. Um, and a sparse Merkle tree is a special Merkle tree structure where every element, essentially if I have an element with the ID five, it is the fifth leaf. So if here I want to have the element A, it, it's, the, it's in the zeroth leaf always. And uh, this allows us essentially to also have both inclusion proofs and non-inclusion proofs. So I can prove that an element actually was not included in the Merkle tree. And uh, this is essentially, uh, Ethereum currently uses a variant of a Merkle tree structure called Patricia Merkle tree. Merkle trees, which are, as some people say that they're slightly less efficient than this and maybe it's being considered that sparse Merkle trees will be used in Ethereum. And in order to do essentially a non-inclusion proof, what you're doing is that you prove that at the, at the index in the tree, you're just proving that the element that was included is the empty element. Essentially, you prove non-inclusion by proving inclusion of the empty element. And uh, we can do some opti optimizations to make the proofs even shorter, which, yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, so I'll go over the deposit flow. So how do we actually get the funds on the plasma chain? So we have Alice, the usual suspects. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, be, we, we should get new names for this, I guess. So we have Alice, and uh, Alice 
deposit some funds to an Ethereum smart contract. Let's say she deposits five Ether. And uh, what happens is that the, the smart contract, it, does an, it emits an event. And this event, it gets picked up by the Plasma chain. So the Plasma chain is always listening for events from Ethereum. And this means that whenever the, plasma, the Ethereum smart contract emits an event, a new coin is created. And this new coin, it is essentially a single coin which has a certain value. So in Plasma Cash, I said that coins are non-fungible. This means that what I get is not actually, yeah, this is Bob, by the way. And uh, in Plasma Cash, what happens is that the coins that you get, they're non-fungible. So it's one input, one output. It's like cash. So if I, deposit a five, uh, if I deposit some funds and I have a five Ether coin, that coin, I cannot split it. So if I have five, I cannot split it in 2.5 2, 2 and 2.5. Like if I have a bill and I split it in half and I tear it in half, it's useless, right? So uh, it's one input, one output. Alice gives a coin to Bob. And this coin can have any value. And it doesn't have to be just an Ether coin. It can be RC20, it can be a Crypto Kitty, it can be a Crypto Zombie, like we all love, and so on. So uh, let's say that now we have our funds on the Plasma chain. So we deposited them, the fund appeared through some magic way on the Plasma chain, I have the coin ID, and now I want to pass it around. So I am Alice, and I want to give it to Bob, let's say. So when I give it to Bob, I need to reference the inclusion of the coin in the first block. So I always, whenever the, the safety condition in Plasma Cash is that whenever I receive a coin, so if we're doing a real world uh, transaction, I have a product that I want to sell for one, let's say I want to sell for five Ether. I, whenever I receive a coin, I need to verify the coin's history. And this is in order to make sure that the coin I'm receiving is actually not counterfeit, right? So, and we're seeing right now why. So when, I, when Bob receives the coin, he checks. Is the coin in block one valid? He checks it, it's valid, we're good. Now block three gets submitted, maybe some other coins move, we do not care about that because we're currently uh, monitoring Alice's coin. And so at block three, nothing happens. However, it is the case that when Charlie wants to receive a coin from Bob, so when Bob sends the coin to Charlie, Charlie not only has to verify that the coin was actually included in block one and two, but he also has to verify that there was no coin in block three. Because if there was an inclusion of block three, so imagine like an arrow from here to here and from here to here, it means that Charlie would be accepting a double spend, which we do not want. So it is the case that we want to check the whole history of a coin in order to make sure that it's safe to receive the coin. And then if I want to exit a coin, so if I want to take it back to Ethereum, what I'll do is that I will start an exit. And uh, the protocol defines that in order to exit a coin, we provide both the block that we received the coin on and a previous block, a parent block, as we call it. And this is used in order to construct the exit game, as we call it, which we're getting on right now. And also, I want to say, so like Roy said, there is sort of always a delay between when an action happens and when some withdrawal happens. And we do this for the following reason. So at T0, so let's say I start an exit. But what happens is that I need to give like some... Um, some waiting period, some dispute period, that during this period, anybody can challenge me. So if we're at T0, I start an exit, I can only finalize and withdraw the coin if we're here. But what happens is that if there is any challenge to my exit, so if I say, I have this coin, but it's not actually my coin, it's somebody else's. That's somebody else, they're watching, and they will say, no, no, it's not your coin, this is, it is my coin, and they will cancel my exit. And uh, we also create this thing that when you start an exit, you also need to put up some stake. So I say, I want to exit my coin, and here is one ether to make, to make my claim. And you know what? If you can actually challenge me, you're free to take the ether. And this incentivizes honest exits only. Because if you try to exit and you get challenged, not only will you not exit, but you will also lose your collateral. And the collateral will go to the watcher. So this is how we construct it so that the incentives match. So, and this is modeled via state machine, so you can think of each coin as its own state machine. So we have a coin that can be in the deposited state, in the exiting state, and in the exited state. And a coin, initially when we put it in the, in the side chain, in the plasma chain, it is in the, in the deposited state. And when we start an exit and attach a bond to it, it goes in the exiting state. 
And to go from the exiting to the exited state, we must wait for the coin to mature, as I, as I call it. So I mean that the dispute period uh, has passed, so we need to wait. Usually we set this to seven days because we think that's enough. But there is actually no um, formal approach to this currently set. It's a security parameter of the system because if you allow, if you allow like only one minute challenge period versus seven, min seven uh, days challenge period, obviously the seven day challenge period, there is more room, more time for people to come and say, no, you're trying to cheat. And so what happens is that when a coin is in the exiting period, it can be challenged. And if it's challenged, it either goes directly back to the deposited state or it is a sort of interactive challenge. And I'm getting into what an interactive and non-interactive challenge is a bit. The point is that in order to finalize an exit, the coin must not have any challenge during these seven days. So um, if Alice has a coin at block N, and then she sends it at Bob at block some later block, then Alice, what she can do in order to cheat is that she can exit the coin. She can exit at block N. But this is not valid because Alice actually no longer owns the coin. So Alice exits the coin, and what Bob can do in this case, he can challenge the exit of a spent coin. And this is, like, this is a non-interactive challenge. So I exit, he challenges, it's cancelled. The other approach is the double spend. So Alice has a coin, she sends it to Bob, and she also sends it to Charlie. Earlier, we said that Charlie should verify that the coin has valid history. So if Charlie was an honest user, he wouldn't be able, he would say, no, there's an extra transaction in the coin's history, so I will not accept it. But Charlie, we consider that in this example, Charlie is actually a friend of Alice, and they're both trying to steal money from Bob. And what happens is that if Charlie exits, notice that we give, we need two blocks. So we gave both the block that we got the coin at and the parent block. And Bob needs to challenge with a block in between. And so we call this a challenge of a double spend, or you can think of it challenge as challenge between. That's how it's written in the code, for example. And uh, are the two inter the two, these two challenges clear? Because this one is, uh, the next one is a bit more uh, complex. So in this one, what happens is that, so in the previous two uh, challenges, we do not require for uh, we be, this can ha the previous two challenges can happen simply when two users when a user is trying to cheat. For this challenge to happen, it means that the user is also colluding with the plasma chain. So the plasma chain itself must be trying to cheat some money from the user. The plasma chain itself, when I'm saying it, means that it's validators, it's operator, it's consensus mechanism. The consensus mechanism of the plasma chain is compromised, and it wants to steal some money from the users. And let's consider the case that Alice has some money at block N, and the consensus mechanism, it generates a transaction which gives Bob this money. And then Bob spends the coin, and they spend it again, and so on. What happens is that we consider that Bob, Charlie, and Dylan, they're all trying to cheat and get Alice's coin, and they will share the profits or whatever. And what happens is that if Dylan tries to exit here, he makes an exit as usual, he references this block and the parent block, but what happens is that Alice sees the exit and she says, no, I am the latest owner of the coin. Like, what are you doing? And when Alice challenges, we also need to wait here because Alice, if Alice says that she's actually the latest owner of the coin, that might not be true. So if we consider that Alice is honest, she will say, okay, there will be the latest owner of the coin is at block N. However, if she's not honest, so if there was the red arrow, if there was a transaction from Alice to Bob, there is a way to respond to this challenge and cancel it. So it is, instead of being an instant challenge, it is an interactive challenge because you do exit, challenge, response. And uh, because there is also, again, there is a response, you also need to make the challenge to also have a bond. So essentially, Dylan exits, puts up one ether, Alice challenges, puts one more ether, and if there is, no if there is a response, the challenger will get both. They will get both the 0 point, the 0 0.1 and they will the end Dylan will get the will get the 0 0.1 the one ether back. So there are some problems that uh, so this is how the exit game works. You basically have an exit and three challenges. And when, if the if the dispute period passes without the challenge, you can get your money out. 
But there are a few problems with the current, uh, not with the current approaches, but there's, you do not get free lunch. There's always some trade-offs that you need to do. So we encountered, like when we were building this thing, we encountered, we encountered some things such as the plasma chain and the root chain. So the plasma chain is the side chain and the root chain is the contract on mainnet. They need to be in sync. So if at some point some condition happens and the plasma chain creates some extra blocks, it suddenly is not in sync with the main chain contract. So from an implementation level, it is very challenging to keep things synchronized. You need to make sure that if something happens on the one chain, the same thing happens on the contract and the opposite. So this is like you need to be careful. And uh, when you want, and you also need to apply the events on the plasma chain in the right order. So whenever, if I make a depo if I make five deposits, these five deposits they need to be appear in the plasma chain in the right order. We also need to make sure that if a client goes offline and then they log in again, they also need to download everything that they missed. And this is essentially what a light client does. They need to sync from any state that they missed. And finally, um, we need to make we need to keep the clients light. So a client cannot be expected to be like totally stateless. They need to have some state stored so that they do not have to download everything every time you start them up. And let's see, so, so far so good. We have a scheme that works, but how can we do better? But also premature optimization is a bad thing. So we need to say like, when are we content with what we have right now? So, so far we have only one input, one output. I have a coin, I give it to somebody else. I have a dollar bill and I give it to somebody else. But we want to do better, so we want to do, if I have a $5, five dollar bill, I want to be able to send smaller denominations. And there are various approaches to this. So firstly, we can go with a change provider. So like when you go to a store, you pay with $10 and you get three back. So here in this example, if I pay with a seven ether coin for a five ether product, I should be able to get a two ether change. But this uh, has the challenge that we need to do an atomic transaction. So the moment I send the, five, the seven ether coin, I need to get the two, the two chains back in, the, in one transaction which is not trivial to do because it can be the case that you send the seven and then you do not get the two back because essentially you trust that intermediate step when they send you the two back. And we need to make this trustless. The second way to do this is the called plasma debit. It's one of the many names of the plasma variants. And what you do is that instead of having one coin, instead of thinking of a coin as a one specific coin, you can consider it as a thing that goes from zero, if, if it's a five ether coin, it's a coin that can go from zero to five, not just five. And essentially, if we have two coins, one that is five ether and another that is three out of five, essentially, if I reduce my coin's balance by two, and if I, if I increase the other coin's balance by two, I essentially made a two, co a two ether transaction. And you also need this to be atomic. So these two approaches are very similar, but with a different implementation. And the final uh, approach that we can use, which is what is called the uh, cash flow or plasma prime or whatever you want to call it, um, it's that when I deposit one, one ether, instead of getting one ether, one, one ether coin, I get 100 0 0.01 ether coins. And I can use this to make arbitrary denomination transactions where it's not really arbitrary, it is up to 0 0.01 denominations. So I can do 0 0.01, 0 0.2, and so on. This has multiple challenges which are currently being worked on. Secondly, um, we want to make light clients even lighter. So Plasma Cache is the, the, the variant which currently has the lightest uh, data requirements for clients, but we want to make it even better. So firstly, there are various approaches. So instead of checking a coin's history since it's deposit block, because when I'm receiving a coin, I said that we need to check all the transactions in the history. Instead of doing that, we can add checkpoints, which, is, which lines up very nicely with what the depots uh, does, where you anyway you make checkpoints, so we can sort of combine them. So if I have a coin and uh, a checkpoint at block 10, but it was deposited at block 1, I need to check only after block 10, which reduces the amounts. And these checkpoints, they need to be consistent. Another approach is to use to do less frequent commitments. 
So in Plasma, right now, every block that gets generated must be committed. And this, it costs, it costs, and it also increases the blocks being produced, so it also increases the amount of uh, proofs that you need to hold. And then what you, we can also do is that we can use either Bloom filters, accumulators that are the RSA accumulators are being currently worked on, or we can use, essentially, instead of having to pass around the whole coin history, what we can do is that we can generate a short proof for it, and we can pass that around. And instead of having to pass around like 200 megabytes, we can pass around like a short digest with like maybe a few kilobytes and use that as a proof. But this requires fancier cryptography, and we're not yet sure how it will be done in practice. Other approaches to make it better, they are fast withdrawals and optimistic exits. So there are two problems. Firstly, you need to wait seven days for an exit, because if that exit is challenged, it's not so cool. Um, however, what we can do is that we can essentially tokenize its exit, and I say that I want to exit five Ether, so somebody else will say, okay, I will buy your exit, and I will give you back 4.9 Ether. And essentially, they made some money on this trade if the chain, the exit finally settles after seven days. So what you can do in this case is that instead, essentially, instead of having to wait seven days, you pay a small, small fee, and you get your funds out instantly. And the fee, it is also a competitive market, so it also aligns up very nicely with the fees that the depots validator set. Another thing is the optimistic exits. So currently, when you're exiting, you need to provide the coin, the, the block that you're exiting, the Merkle proofs for two, co for two blocks, and you also need to provide the signature. And that is not too, many, too much data, but we want to do better. And essentially, we can assume that an exit is valid, not provide these proofs in the beginning when we're making the exit, and essentially, we can add one more type of challenge, which says, no, your proofs are not valid, your attestation is not valid, because here are the proofs. So essentially, instead of revealing the proofs in the beginning, we reveal them in the end. And we can use this in the optimistic case that the exits are actually honest in order to reduce the data. And I want to have some final notes on uh, Plasma. So it does not improve finality. So all these one million transactions per second that you hear about Plasma, it's not exactly accurate. Because Plasma, you still, your transaction settles after every block commitment. So whenever a block gets committed and the proofs for you to make sure that your coin is still yours are available, that is when you, be, that, that is when you can be sure that the, transac that the transaction has settled. And this currently happens every, every block. And a block on Ethereum is around 12 to 15 seconds. And this is so, T here is that. So it doesn't actually update the state very often. And this is a use case, a good use case for combining plasma and payment or state channels. Because essentially, instead of waiting every T seconds, you update the state, you have instant finality within the channel. And after the block comes, you commit it. What plasma does is that it's essentially a compression mechanism. Instead of having to put all the transactions on chain, what you were doing is that essentially you put just 32 bytes of the, of the, of the block that happened, of the Merkle root of the block that happened. And uh, this essentially it allows you to settle more transactions per block. Because currently, if a block can hold around, I don't know, 380 transactions, you can make it hold many, many more than that. So, yeah, thank you for your attention. And you can find our code, our CLI, and the paper in this repos. I'm sorry for speaking fast. Yeah.